Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. My name is Morgan Lewin. I am one of the moderators of Ask Historians, writing under the username A Quarterman. Joining me today is my friend Darren Colborn. Uh, he is a third year PhD candidate at Queen's University Belfast in the School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy and Politics. Based out of the George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice, his research evaluates identity change and group cohesion in new left student movement. His primary historical focus centers on the Northern Irish organization, the People's Democracy. He utilizes an interdisciplinary and comparative approach to examine the, the people's democracy's role within the wider new left milieu and puts their ideology into conversation with that of the students for a democratic society. His work hopes to establish the centrality of the people's democracy to Northern Ireland's long 60s. Welcome, Darren. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, I guess that the first question is, uh, what exactly is the people's democracy? And how, how, can, how can we uh, make the people's democracy interact with the Northern Irish conflict? Well, in many ways, the people's democracy is such a specific phenomenon that it's difficult to break down or contextualize or analyze without putting it into conversation with everything that was happening around it, both in the domestic sphere and the international sphere. It, it was a very much a unique movement for Northern Ireland, and it took a lot of these different disparate elements of the new left that I think some listeners might be more familiar with and applied them to this specific context. So in a really broad stroke, uh, the People's Democracy was a participatory democracy group started at Queen's University um, in 1968 at the beginning of October. They were founded on principles of, um, like I said, participation in the democratic process. They were at the time a movement, not an organization. There was no membership. You could not sign up to join. You simply went to a meeting and you could have your voice heard and you could speak out about any issue that was important at the time. As time went on in Northern Ireland and things obviously changed, which I know we'll talk about more, the people's democracy consolidated um, around 1969, back in October again, actually, almost exactly one year later, the people's democracy adopts a formal party structure. They become a centralized organization with branches throughout many different towns and cities in the north. And they adopt what one might want to call a quasi Trotskyist political line, though that's also up for internal debate. And we'll talk about that more as well. But I guess then to just like sum it all up, the People's Democracy was a new left student led movement that dispersed out from campuses in 1969 in Northern Ireland and eventually became a Trotskyist political, political organization that was interested in non sectarian. So they did not consider themselves as being particularly aligned with either the Protestant or Catholic uh, populations and communities here and socialist. So looking for a bottom up, uh, Entire, Ir entire Ireland movement for socialism in the 32 counties. That's very interesting um, because one of, the, one of the things that I think are more important to look at about this particular time period is the date because you talk about 1968 and 1969 and we all know uh, what that means in terms of a, a very radical shift in political ideologies, not just in Europe but that ended up spreading elsewhere. Um, so what did the, this new left you were mentioning look like in Northern Ireland during the, this particular time period? Well, it's really interesting because if you think of the new left as I think we might understand it, like the Sorbonne in France or the Columbia revolts in New York City, or I mean, I'm just talking about the Western North. You have Mexico City, you have Tokyo, you have all these different parts of the world. Northern Ireland, at least on its campuses, is such a unique case because there's really only one major university in Northern Ireland at this time. So if we're going back a couple of years before 68, because obviously the new left had been given birth to, at least academically, at well before that point, probably at the turn of the 60s, because you had things like the New Left Review, which were uh, projecting these ideas from mostly the UK bases out back towards the United States. You had writers like C. Wright Mills. You had Students for a Democratic Society forming in 1960 and then the Port Huron Statement in 62. So Northern Ireland is in some ways sort of late to the party. Um, one of the primary sources I like to use, uh, especially here, are old issues of The Gown, which is Queen's University's newspaper. And if you're going through from about 65 to 66, you don't see a lot of 
I guess you would call it politicization on the campus. Now you have your normal kind of issues um, with your student union and the connection between Queens and the uh, National Union for Students in the UK or the, uh, the Ireland Union of Students in the southern part of the country. Those things all come up. But it's not really until 1966 when this little group called the Republican Club tried to form on campus. So the Republican clubs were, and this is a much larger story that's a little bit out of my wheelhouse, they were an attempt to take what would later become um, this sort of left-leaning line of republicanism and have these meeting places across the northern part of the country. Queens wanted to establish its own student organization that would be a Republican club, and that was not allowed by the student union because Republican clubs were officially banned. So you start to see this politicization in 66 around an issue which one might call, and I'm doing the square quotes, you can't see me because it's a podcast, sectarianism. And the PD at this time obviously didn't exist, but the students who had become a part of it were either in the university, about to enter the university, or they were older students who were at the time living in the UK. So they all would have been familiar with this incident with the Republican clubs in 66 and 67. And at the same time, you had these other um, political organizations and groups on campus. So you had uh, the young members of the Northern Ireland Labor Party. You had a very small contingent of Ulster liberals. And then you had the young unionist group as well. So while there were politics on campus, there wasn't quite the same sense of the radicalization you would have already seen somewhere like the United States, for example. By 66, 67, we'd already had um, SDS's March on Washington. You'd had the free speech movement at Berkeley there wasn't anything quite like that yet. And it wouldn't be until 68 and events outside of the university space occurred that all that would come kind of crashing back down into Queens proper. I find it very interesting that there had to be a, sort of a, a, a context for things to start actually shifting and changing within the academic community and within, within the university community. Because again, because as you were mentioning, this particular time frame was definitely marked by uh, a radicalization of many student movements all over the world. Um, I'm reminded of here in Argentina in 1969, around the time um, the People's Democracy became an actual political party, a little earlier because it, I think it was in early May. But here in Argentina in 69, we, we see something very interesting happening, which is called El Cordobazo which was in the city of Córdoba, which is the second largest city of Argentina and where the oldest university in the entire continent was founded. It is about 450 years old at this point. Um, students from this university, the National University of Córdoba, they mobilized and they formed a, a very unlikely alliance with, with workers' unions to strike against the national government, which was a dictatorship, uh, the self-proclaimed Argentinian Revolution dictatorship, um, and they they basically started burning the city down. It, it was it was a very aggressive set of demonstrations and protests that turned into rioting. Um, that was definitely and very heavily influenced by what happened in Europe and in the United States as well with these student movements during the mid to late sixties. So I think it's it's very interesting how we can draw these these parallels between social political context and specifically socioeconomic context that were definitely very, very different. So the, these, I think that it's, it's fascinating to find these parallels. And since we're looking at parallels, at the same time that these things were happening in Northern Ireland, we see uh, the, um, in the United States, we see the Black Civil Rights Movement. So what can you tell us about uh, if there was any kind of relationship between the, this movement and the, the Black Civil Rights Movement? There was a massive, massive connection. Um, to this day, if any of the, your listeners want to come out to Northern Ireland, if you were to go to Derry, uh, there's a really wonderful museum um, called the Free Derry Museum that looks back at the history of the civil rights movement here uh, up through the tragic events of Bloody Sunday in 1972. But on the exterior wall of that museum, there is a sound wave, a sound file. And if you were to be able to play it, um, it would play We Shall Overcome. So Northern Ireland Civil Rights uh, Association, the NICRA, when they would do marches, actually adopted um, not just the marching tactics, the direct confrontational but nonviolent tactics of the civil rights movement in the United States. They borrowed some of the cultural aspects as well, uh, the songs, a lot of the chanting. You can see these very direct connections. And we'll talk about it more as we go um, into the future part of the history uh, of the PD. But the major 
incident that the PD was a part of was an attack at a place called Burn Tolet. It was a bridge along a marching route they took from Belfast to Derry. They called this march the Long March, and they had self-stylized it on the march of Martin Luther King from Selma. So that was always the plan. And they had the same kind of understanding that they were going to be themselves nonviolent, but they wanted to show if they were attacked or if they faced any kind of opposition, sectarian-based or from the police, that the state itself would not step in to help them. And they were essentially trying to physically call out the hypocrisy of the state. And that event is widely written about in Troubles literature, widely written about in Northern Irish literature. It's probably the most central event that the PD was a part of. Uh, it's very contested history, what happened, why it happened. Um, that's one of the things that I very much study. But to your original question, there was a deep, deep overlap. In fact, in 1969, this would have been, I'm always bad with dates, which is not great for a historian. This is why I like to write things down. <laughs> uh, this would have been after the violence in August. So probably end of August up through October, the PD and Bernadette Devlin, who is maybe along with even McCann and Jerry Adams, like the most famous people I can think of from, you know, this time period. Um, though Jerry Adams wouldn't have been famous yet at this time. So Bernadette Devlin came over to the United States along with some PD members uh, on a tour. And essentially what she wanted to do was raise money to fix the things that had been destroyed in the August rioting of 1969. So she went on a national tour of the country, um, meeting all kinds of people, trying to make money, trying to get her message out there. And when she returned, what she essentially said was she felt significantly more at home with the Black movement, the Black liberation struggle people. She met Angela Davis. She met some of the Panthers, uh, the PD. Um, the PD representative who came over also stayed with the Black Panthers. And they found that they had a lot more in common with them than they did with Irish Americans, which is where they would have thought they were going to get this money from. There's actually a lot that happened on that trip that's really interesting. And I would say, again, to your listeners that it's worth looking into. Two major events I want to point out because I think they're really, really interesting. Uh, so on Bernadette's trip, she was supported by an organization that had some members from SDS as a part of it. And there was a man whose last name was Glazer. I'm forgetting his first name at the moment. But he was more or less responsible for dictating where the funds from her trip were going to go. And he is on record very famously as saying, I, I don't really care what she wants. I don't think it matters, like it going into these communities to rebuild houses or to put out fires or do whatever. We want this money for weapons, essentially, to arm these communities in case of a need of mutual defense. And she was aware of this happening. She was aware of the kinds of people she was speaking to. And the last stop on Devlin's tour was supposed to be Boston, which, if we're being stereotypical, that is your Irish-American, you know, mecca. That is the capital place you're going to go. Uh, she cut the trip short. She didn't go. She left before that and said, I have no interest in doing so. She also, on the trip, received the key to the city of New York. Um, when she returned, even McCann said, why would you have accepted that? And when they came back, they gave it to the Black Panther Party. So... There was both an ideological connection to the civil rights struggle and a very real, tangible, physical connection to the struggle for Black liberation as well. That is pretty fascinating. Um, th those connections are always... Because here's the thing, you, you, you made a huge mistake, my friend. Uh, because you talked about music, uh, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> You shouldn't have done that. <laughs> you are supposed to be the, you're supposed to be, uh, the guest. Uh, so I'm doing, I'm going to do my best to not, um, turn all of this into a conversation about music, but there is always a very interesting element that comes, uh, with the, the conceptualizations that are formed in political movements, particularly radical or revolutionary or protest political movements, regardless of what exactly you're trying to accomplish that deals with utilizing music as a form of, of propaganda or proselytism or whatever you want to call it and i think it's very very interesting i'm going to say that word a lot because it is very interesting that because again there is a very um if you if i think personally if i think about the music that represents the civil rights movement in the united states and the music that represents uh Northern Ireland and this particular time period, I am never going to think of the same song 
or the same songs being sung by people marching on the streets because it's it's not uh, the kind of association that you would normally do. But me, not as a regular person, but me as an ethnomusicologist, I can definitely understand how that would happen and how that would end up being the case because there is there has been a tendency towards unification in the usage of protest music and protest songs that transcends every possible uh, physical border, every, possi- uh, every possible ethnic or religious border, so much so that many of the protest songs that are sung today were sung hundreds of years ago because what changes are the lyrics, what changes is the language, but the actual music, the actual evocation that is sought through uh, the sound ends up being the same. To anyone interested in these kinds of, uh, in how this ended up evolving, there is a very interesting book uh, by Laura Mason called Singing the French Revolution, which studies specifically the role that popular music played in the streets in propagating uh, messages of liberation, of emancipation, of revolution uh, in the last years leading up to the French Revolution and also during the very early days and years of the Republic, the First Republic. And many of those songs that were sung on the streets by, uh, by regular street performers ended up becoming songs that people would sing in marches as the, the revolutionary movement started growing in France. And we're talking about something that happened over 250 years ago. And the same concept and the same, the, the same constructions of meaning that go from merely a sound by itself to uh, an anthem for a revolutionary movement or a protest movement or any form of political movement ends up being the same. So I think it's very, very interesting to look at this, at this particular overlap. Do you have any specific songs that you can mention that were in this particular overlap? The big one is We Shall Overcome. Uh, mm-hmm. That is the classic. I, I don't remember exactly when that song was said to be written. I want to say it was the mid to late 1940s. Um, the actual recording that people would know if they heard it, but it was absolutely sung on the streets of Mississippi, Alabama, and then here in Belfast and on the Long March to Derry. That is the one in particular. Uh, but while we're talking about music, it not just cross context, but temporally in the same context, music obviously in Northern Ireland is is a massive deal. Whether you're talking about the pipe bands and the drum bands from the parades that happen or uh, Irish folk music, which some of it is, you know, rebel music, some of them are rebel songs. Again, I haven't really contextualized timing, which I am not uh, a native historian podcaster, so I need to do that better. But before I do that very definitively, one other thing the PD is known for, even when they were kind of shrinking in size, was during the riots that occurred in 1969 in August, uh, about mid-August, PD was behind the barricades, essentially acting as, they had several roles, but I guess um, you could say they were acting as a mobile propaganda wing. Uh, They produced the paper for the free area of Belfast, and they ran the radio station. So not only would they put out sometimes like funny bits, uh, they would put out um, like information people needed, they would play music. And that included things like popular music of the time. It included folk songs and then very, very contested some sectarian music as well. Now, I've done interviews with several people from the organization. They would tell you in differing levels of assurity that there was no sectarian nature to the music they played. Not a lot of the secondary liter- like literature takes that seriously. Um, we're, we're pretty sure they played some songs that would, even if they were not outwardly what you would call a rebel song, if you were someone from a different community, the other community listening in, you would be aware of what the song represented. So music played a massive part, not just across context, but temporally over time, because these folk songs would have been around for, you know, decades and decades at this point. Right, of course, of course. And I think it's interesting that you mentioned this this idea of using this, these broadcasts and these particular songs to send a message not just in general but also specific messages that as you were saying you know if you are listening to this particular song and you're from this specific community you will understand that this is meant for you um because again that is also usually something that tends to happen a lot with these political movements the use of music as a medium for propaganda as a vehicle for political propaganda and for 
just in general for transmitting ideology. Usually it has a lot to do with uh, a very, very interesting idea that was actually the, designed by a Canadian musicologist called Maury Schiffer. He explains and he designed the concept called soundscape, which deals with the specific context, not just the physical, but the cultural and economic context in which a certain set of sounds are produced. Um, it, it has a lot to do with the, how folk music evolves, but also how more contemporary forms of popular music and protest music end up evolving. Because a lot of the, the music that we choose to use to transmit certain specific information or emotions or ideas or concepts or whatever we're trying to uh, communicate through the music we listen to, to the music we show other people or the music we broadcast in this particular instant, ends up being very, um, very heavily influenced by the specific context in which we exist. Even if we don't really realize it at the time, the, not just the political landscape in which we're living, but the actual physical landscape in which we are inscribed is very much associated with the way in which we decide how to create music in the first place or how to utilize music that has existed before and that for some reason ends up being instrumental to this development of different, uh, the, the, the different ideological uses that music can have. You can see that physically in um, what was called Free Belfast, because while Free Belfast did not have the more rigid borders of something like Free Dairy, which I think is significantly more famous, uh, through the end of August and then into early September, the barricades were mobile here, but you sort of knew certain areas that were definitively part of Free Belfast. And talking to a couple of Republicans um, for my project, they mentioned that they knew exactly where the radio station was and what you would see are these young kids, essentially, uh, seven, eight, nine years old. They would run and ask family members or friends, family members, what song they wanted to hear. And then they would run to what was called the long bar and the radio was set up above the bar and they would come in with essentially requests or lists of songs that people wanted to listen to. So it was very much geographically, you know, who could have their voice heard to play a song, who could come over and stay within this barricaded area that again was somewhat fluid and ask for this to be played or to have this message passed out. So it very much did leave this indelible geographic imprint just because of the requirements of that time period. Okay. Maybe if I ever do a PhD, which I probably never will, uh, maybe I will look into the, the different soundscapes that developed in Belfast during the, this time period. So you, you can hook me up at your university with something. Um, but now, leaving music aside for a little while, uh, but so we can go back to the actual topic in hand. Um, so we were talking about the, this, this relationship that was established between the PD and the civil rights movement in the United States, but within the actual context of uh, Northern Ireland, um, how did the PD interact with the Republican movement? Uh, and also, uh, how exactly did this relationship evolve or change when, as the troubles continue moving on? So just to, because I pr made the promise, just to give the specific dates for people following along. So in 5th of October of 1968, uh, there was a housing march in, or housing march that was also part of a civil rights march in Derry. This march was brutally suppressed by the RUC, which is the police force here. Uh, and it was captured on several different forms of news media. The first person who was attacked was an 18-year-old correspondent for the, essentially, I think it was the BBC, very young man who was reporting the stuff. So this exploded. Northern Ireland went from this periphery kind of problem to being all over the world on your television set. On the 9th of October, the PD officially formed. Uh, again, as much as a movement can form, it was a mobilization at the time. The riot that broke out in the, I think it was the 12th to 16th of August, and then Free Dairy and Free Belfast continued on in September, Dairy even longer. Um, those were spawned by violence that followed the Apprentice Boys Parade on the 12th of August in Dairy. Those are the major riots that people consider the beginning of the Troubles. That's obviously contested as well, but if you ask like your layperson on the street, they would say sometime in August of 1969. Then PD adopted their formalized structure um, as a party. They ran candidates before doing that too, but they adopted a membership structure with branches in October of 1969. So that's kind of where we're at. 
their relationship to the Republican movement was fluid, very fluid, and not the least because the Republican movement, when the PD officially formed, had not yet split themselves. So you had, at the time, the IRA and Sinn Féin, Sinn Féin being the political wing of the IRA, which in the mid to late 60s was essentially what you call a rubber stamp organization. The IRA and their army council were the ones who were running the show, so to speak. And it's outside the scope of what we're talking about now, but the IRA was at the time going through some internal strife, a lot of it having to do with how leftward they wanted to move their organization. And when I say leftward for them, it was not new left. It, it was this very interesting assortment of old left ideas borrowed from thinkers who would have probably come into contact with the ideas of the new left. Uh, Roy Johnson's one in particular, he came over from the UK into Dublin and worked with what would later become the official IRA. But at the time, the IRA is still its own thing. And they have members who are part of the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association. So the big broad tent group for civil rights had communists, it had moderates, it had Republicans, um, certainly members who would have been significantly influential within the IRA proper. And then the PD, which was their more radical, young, militant, new left wing expression of that. So at the time, what you would probably see was the PD contesting for influence within the NICRA with its leadership. And its leadership then was either old school Communist Party individuals or these interlopers from the IRA of the period. So they had to interact with them. And then in August, behind the barricades, it was Republicans who were essentially in charge. So you had these citizen action committees. Um, they were responsible for everything from telling people to take out their trash to the mutual defense of the barricades to making sure people were uh, essentially towing the proper line. And the PD had a difficult time with this. They had their own ideological ideas. They were a different form, different flavor of leftism and very much ideological at this point. The IRA had their hands full with a lot of stuff at that time, obviously, whether it was the communal defense, whether it was trying to establish um, any form of cooperation, you would say, with the military once they came in. So the PD found themselves kind of the odd man out. Uh, they, were, they eventually stopped running Radio Free Belfast. They stopped producing the Citizen Press because they could not get along with the Republican movement as it existed in 1969. Now, when the Republican movement splits later that year, at the very, very end of the year going into 1970, you obviously get the officials and the provisionals. Uh, most listeners who are familiar with any of this probably know of the IRA as the provisional Irish Republican Army. The differences there are very, very specific. There's a lot of narrative building around it. There is a lot of mythology that surrounds it. But suffice to say, at the most basic terms, by 1972-73, the provisionals are the dominant militarily capable IRA organization. And their ideology is extremely fluid. So the PD sees themselves at this point being a very small, concentrated, organized, uh, left-wing, semi-Trotskyist organization as maybe something of a vanguard that could feasibly push the provisionals in a left-wing direction. Doing so cost them a lot of moderate support. It cost them a lot of mass mobilization support. And in the end, as you go through the 70s and into the early 80s, they just start bleeding members to these organizations. Uh, several members quit the PD to join Sinn Féin as it becomes more politically, I guess you would say, politically capable. Uh, no longer just a rubber stamp organization, but an actual political force. And yeah, so they have a very fluid relationship with them. But it pays to remember, too, that the IRA had a lot of stuff going on internally. So there was no way the PD was probably going to maintain a consistent through line with them because they couldn't contain a consistent through line themselves. And looking at the international landscape, uh, how did they interact with elsewhere? They, it's an interesting question because the answer is they kind of didn't in a very hands-on physical way. So if we're talking about the start of the PD, you had people like Eamon McCann um, and then the major ideological thought leader of the PD, uh, Michael Farrell, who had spent time in the UK with various different organizations of uh, political makeup. So you had the Irish Workers Group, which was a small mid-60s Trotskyist organization that Farrell would have been very, very um, familiar with. You had the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, which even McCann participated in. 
So they had relationships with those groups, with the Radical Socialist Student Federation, which tried to form a small branch at Queens, and it sort of worked, and that was a UK-based organization originally. So you had these overlapping spheres and webs and networks of influence among prominent members and these organizations. But as you get into 69 and 1970, the reality is essentially a low intensity war had broken out in Northern Ireland. You had the military on the streets, you had um, these armed struggle organizations. uh, And for people listening, again, I don't tend to use words like terrorism or terrorist. That is kind of a normative judgment that I have to explain my methodology that I do not use, but these organizations um, were in open conflict with the state. So to actually have physical direct interaction with these other new left organizations wasn't necessarily in the cards at that point, which isn't to say it didn't happen. Of course, Bernadette Devlin went over to the United States. She met Black Panthers. She met members of SDS. There were people from the poster printing group in London uh, and a collective of anarchists who came over in 69 to set up all of these really cool silkscreen printing presses so they could make their massive posters that they put up all over Free Belfast. I'm, I've am i heard it said, I don't know this for sure yet, I need to corroborate with more PD members, that that was the organization that actually set up Radio Free Belfast. These UK anarchist collectives came over, and by the time PD had even gotten behind the barricades, everything was set up and ready for them. In the early 1970s, you had American radicals coming over or trying to. Uh, Tom Hayden, famously of SDS, tried to fly over and he was stopped in Dublin and immediately turned around. Abby Hoffman came over, I want to say in 72, and uh, was thrown out for being essentially Abby Hoffman too often. Aside from that, you mostly get these abstract generalities that are shared among contexts. So you get these kind of similar frames that even though the domestic situation was unique, you know, Belfast is not Detroit, Derry is not Berkeley, you still had very similar, I guess you would call them thematic through lines. These relationships with new forms of mass media, this need to have these underground presses uh, or free radios or the idea that you could have these no-go zones, these barricaded areas that are politicized for your organization or your community. I use scare quotes there again because as any historian sociologist knows, community is a dangerous word. Things are heterogeneous. It's difficult to say what a community is. But in the abstract, You could see things like the barricading of Free Belfast to be similar to the barricading of the different uh, academic buildings during the revolt at Columbia. You had these heterogeneous political organizations with particular demands saying, hey, you, the school, or you, the state, think that you have this particular form of power relational control over this thing. And we are telling you, no, you do not. We have essentially bordered in our own way as a non-state actor and claimed this area. Now, I would never compare, obviously, the occupation of Mathematics Hall in Columbia to the barricades in the Falls Road in Belfast. The intensity of the violence, the scale of what happened is not the same. But the general kind of thematic idea and the Mm -hmm. tools you would use as a historian or sociologist to examine them are pretty similar. And it's really interesting to make those comparisons and see that what people were feeling was very, very similar. So if you read the pieces put out, um, there's an excellent collection right now by Paul Cronin called A Time to Stir, Columbia 68. He collects all of these uh, reminiscence of the events at Columbia. And what you keep reading over and over is that inside of these buildings, people felt like they were getting a political education. They felt like they were participating in something big and they felt like it was a good thing to be doing. And even Mm -hmm. with the intensity and scale of violence here, when I have talked to PD members and Republicans and just people who were behind the barricades and who lived in these areas, they they say the exact same thing, almost verbatim. All the way across the ocean, in such a much different context, the general feeling was very similar. So even if these organizations didn't meet face-to-face, they kind of shared this milieu that permeated both areas in really interconnected and interesting ways. I think that it's, again, we we go back to this idea and this concept that these feelings and these uh, popular emotions were very much, uh, they, they existed very much outside of the idea of a border, to be specific. Um, 
Because again, this is the time, we go back to the time period in which we see a lot of very powerful movements all over the world that are definitely against something that authority is doing. We can call authority, we can, we can name it however we want, but it is the concept of a centralized, institutionalized and controlling authority. Um, so in this, in this particular context, because many of these groups that were formed in the, in the late 60s and 70s that associated or directly uh, called themselves Marxists or socialists, many tried to establish relations with the, the, the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. So was there anything like that happening in the PD trying to get in contact with Brezhnev's government? The PD saw themselves as this essentially third way organization by the time that they had an official party line. So again, I can't like stress this enough to listeners. The PD, when it formed on the 9th of August in 68, up until I don't remember the date of the conference, it would have been the second week of October in 69, they essentially only had five major demands. And they had to do with one man, one vote, one man, one house, those kinds of things. They were very specific and they were for the entirety of the civil rights movement. They ran candidates on essentially housing platforms or just as an alternative to the Nationalist Party or the Unionist Party. And by the time you get to them essentially writing out their quote unquote, you could call it a manifesto, Farrell uh, Farrell wrote it. um, And it was voted on unanimously to pass and change them into a party with a membership based structure. If you read it, it is much more of a Trotskyist line, um, and they will join the Fourth International in the mid-1970s. So the Soviet Union was not something they would have looked to as an ally. A a lot of the people here were, if you're not talking about Mexico City, which they were deeply inspired by, uh, the Czechoslovakia and the um, Prague Spring was something that they will Mm -hmm. always bring up. So they had no love loss necessarily for the Soviet Union. As a matter of fact, the groups that they were most stalwart against uh, were the British and Irish Communist Organization, very small group based out of Dublin. But these were your top down uh, Stalin-esque kind of communists. They were the ones who were thinking what we need to actually do is work from the top down and form socialism that way. PD was entirely bottom up. It was going to have to come from the bottom and you couldn't have a quote unquote united Ireland until you had achieved a a socialist form of government because it wouldn't function otherwise. And this is kind of going away from your question, but it's one more thing I need to stress because I know you'll have some listeners who are probably pretty familiar with this case. The issue of partition, uh, for those who don't know, partition is the split of Northern Ireland in the North and the Republic of Ireland in the South. The PD tried their best to avoid dealing with the question of partition when they were a civil rights centric organization. Partition was not what they were going to focus on. They were focused on socialistic policies and they were focused on civil rights in the North. That would change. And even McCann had an article in the International Socialist, I want to say in 1970 or 71, I can't remember exactly when it was where he said this was a major issue that the PD never really grappled with appropriately because they will come out staunchly in 1970 and say, no, we need to get rid of the border. Like partition is bad. We can't be a part of that. But to have avoided it for so long was to avoid a very, very fundamental political question here. And there are scholars and former activists who think that that was a mistake. So to answer your question specifically, no, there wasn't much interaction with the Soviet Union. And just so we are approaching the end of our episode, uh, so talking about interactions, one of the things that your work focuses on is the interaction that you establish yourself with your methodology with the Students for a Democratic Society from the States. So can you tell us a little bit about that? How, how does that work in particular? Yeah. So what I'm doing is I'm borrowing a form of constructivist sociology from a sociologist named Rogers Brubaker. I believe he is at UCLA. Um, For any of your listeners who are interested in sociology or constructivism, I'd recommend his book Grounds Grounds for Difference or Ethnicity Without Groups. Both are very, very good. What I am doing is borrowing some of his, uh, some of his work to show how organizations go through periods of change. So one thing that comes out of the 1960s 
well, it existed before, but gets talked about a lot in the 1960s is politics of identity, what people, quote unquote, are. And Brubaker, along with many sociologists before him, say identity is a very shaky concept. It's hard to pin down. And in a famous article that he wrote in the early 90s called Beyond Identity, he asks what identity is. And he says, well, when we talk about it in sociology, we're talking about one of two things usually. We're being somewhat essentialist and we're saying identity is something I have. It is something in me that is innate and it connects me um, with other people within that category. Or we're going to be what he calls a cliche constructivist. And identity is always changing. It's constantly fluid. It's in motion and you can't pin it down. And he says, well, both of those are problematic. The first one, because most of us don't really buy that anymore. And the second one, because if we buy into cliche constructivism, you can't really nail down anything analytically. So what I've done is borrow his terminology of identification and self-understanding. And this is how do organizations or the individuals within them posit themselves as an organization? What are they projecting? What are they saying they are? And then counter to that, what is the exterior points in their network and web relationships? What are they saying back? What does Stormont, the government here, say about the PD? What does the Irish Times write about the PD? But then internally, how does Eamon McCann understand the PD? How does Michael Farrell, how does that random student who is a moderate Protestant and isn't really sure how he feels about this whole Trotskyist thing all of a sudden. That's identification and self-understanding. It's fluid, which is nice, but you can nail down moments where there is some consolidation, a little more homogeneity than you were expecting. So I'm looking at the PD through that lens and saying, well, what critical junctures, what critical breaks occurred over their 20, 30 year history where that changed, where that little kind of center of, ah, I know what the identification of this organization is, and now it's something else, or now it's starting to alter. What are the things causing it? What are the outcomes of it? And can we say definitively in this moment what the identification of PD is? And I argue that we can, but to do so, it's significantly easier to compare them to something that is disparate, in this case, the SDS, because it's geographically very far away and temporally different. They're, you know, SDS is breaking up and infighting and just completely imploding by 1968 and 69. And PD is just getting off the ground. And yet there are so many moments of similarity, so many moments of events or confrontations that look similar. And the question is, why is that the case? And why were there Praxis, why were their ideologies, why were their outcomes either the same or similar or different? And my argument there is that it is this form of identification. And that if we look at it through that uh, analytical lens, we can learn a lot about both organizations in general, but the PD in particular, because it's already so understudied. And what exactly led you to this interdisciplinary approach to, to using this uh, ethno methodology? Because again, this isn't something that historians usually use uh, because historians don't really like uh, other social sciences or humanities or whatever you want to call them. Uh, <laughs> so how, how did you arrive to the, to the conclusion that you needed to look at a different methodology than just a traditional historical method? I'm going to give you two answers and both are true. The first answer I hope will hearten any wannabe PhD student or any PhD student who is kind of battling with their thesis at the moment. I applied here in 2020 with the express ambition of doing a deeply archival-based, oral history-based study of the PD. I wanted to just lay it out because I had read in Daniel Finn's excellent 2019 book, One Man's Terrorist, A Political History of the IRA. He specifically says that there has never been a comprehensive look at the PD because their amorphous nature is so difficult to grasp that we can't get a good read on them. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'll be the one. And I sent off my, uh, I sent off my research inquiry to Queens uh, and to my advisor who fortunately accepted it. And then two weeks later, uh, an unpublished dissertation by a very nice individual named Matthew Collins, who's actually a councilman here in Belfast, from Ulster University uh, was out of research embargo and he had done exactly what I was going to do. <laughs> exactly the thing I was going to do. So I said, okay, 
and I read his paper. It's like 400 pages long. It's very, very good. It's open access. Feel free to read it. I believe it's called um, The People's Democracy. <sighs> I am forgetting it now. But Matthew Collins is the name. If you search his name in The People's Democracy, you can read it for free. But I decided, okay, I still want to focus on the PD because now we have one really excellent archival look at the group, but we don't have a great theoretical interpretation of the group. And you're absolutely correct that historians are so difficult about this sometimes. And I was reading a paper by someone who had co-written another paper with Rogers Brubaker where they mentioned that consistently comparative histories fall afoul of this reification of ideas. That when we talk about 1968, we are so unsure of what we're talking about because we have just abstracted it into this unbelievable thing. And the problem is historians either don't want anything to do with that or they kind of take it as gospel. And there's no way to kind of bridge this gap unless you're going to use analytical elements that come from other disciplines. And for me, I don't think uh, this kind of soft constructivism on my end, because I'm not a sociologist, but this methodology is not going to be particularly challenging or problematic to the historical establishment. But I would be interested in seeing significantly more of this kind of thing and this kind of overlap. So this will let me bring PD into the theoretical conversation. It will put them into the web and network with the SDS, and I hopefully will contribute something new to the historiography of the new left in Northern Ireland. Okay, that, that is a very clever answer. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is a very clever answer. If my advisor ends up listening to this, and uh, I'll probably get an email about something there, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> and in the, in the same vein of this idea of, of connecting things, um, you mentioned the, the peripheral character and nature of Northern Ireland up until this moment. And, well, the United States hasn't been a peripheral country in, ever. Um, <laughs> it has never been anything remotely resembled periphery. Um, so why, why would you say that it's important for us to look at uh, this comparative analysis of a, a periphery versus something that is so central as the United States, for example, but the same kinds of political movements end up evolving within them? I actually came at that question backwards because I'm going to agree with uh, Simon Prince, another quite famous histor historian of Irish politics. Um, in his book, Northern Ireland 68, he wrote a new forward to the 2007, I want to believe it was edition, where he says that for a long time, essentially, Within the scholarship of the long 60s, Northern Ireland was the periphery. But if we start to reevaluate it, it becomes so centralized. It, it, is, it is a country where people from France and some people from the United States came and they said, oh, OK, this is how you build a barricade. This is how you defend uh, this kind of neighborhood. And they had these interconnections with something like uh, the SNCC in the U.S. or the civil rights movement more generally in the United States. So I guess... I came at that challenging the idea of it being the periphery in the first place and saying that it, it's kind of stuck in a liminal space. It is a constituent element of the UK, which I would not argue is the periphery, but it's so desperately its own thing. And to put that into conversation with the United States, as you say, never in part of the periphery, it is very much uh, almost a totalitizing force in historiography, especially around this period. I think it's important to show that places like Northern Ireland, cities like Belfast, are impacted by these kind of cultural creations, these kinds of historical moments that share almost a meme, these memifications of these different things. So the way my dissertation is broken up is that each chapter is uh, temporally continuous. I'm tracing PD from 68 to its change to the socialist democracy in you know, the mid-90s. But each chapter has a lens or a focus. Chapter one focuses on participatory democracy. Chapter two on the impact of narrative and media. Chapter three on the politics of community and campus politics, et cetera, et cetera. And those ideas transcended that periphery and um, uh, metropole or centralized idea. Now, they took very, very different formats, obviously. They took different steps in what they did. Their praxis were different. But I would argue that makes the comparison all the more interesting because the moments of similarity that do happen are huge and the moments of difference are so enlightening because within those moments of difference, not only do you learn something about both the organizations you're comparing, but the structures they exist within. 
Because the question is, if they do have these same general themes, these kind of memes of history, of sociology, of what have you, what caused the difference? Was it that the individuals were so different? Or was it that the networks and relationships had to take on a different kind of step? And Northern Ireland being that liminal between the periphery and the center makes it just an intoxicating study of that. I think that maybe the most, uh, that this might be, of all the, the podcast episodes I've ever done, uh, the, the closest to the way in which I approach my historical analysis. Because again, I'm, a, I'm an ethnomusicologist first and a music historian second, because being a music historian is just a part of being an ethnomusicologist. So I exist within the interdisciplinary fields and within comparative studies. Um, and I agree with you in the, the necessity of looking at these comparisons and these interdisciplinary approaches to methodology and to research as something that is becoming increasingly more necessary. Um, because, well, I mean, something that, that comes up often in this, in mass historians in general, is that history is still trying uh, to cling to a certain ideal of, a, of scientific achievement that is that, that doesn't exist anymore uh, of, of being um, sort of an exceptional discipline amongst the humanities and the problem with that idea is that it doesn't allow us to look at these um, at these very interesting counterpoints between uh, specific political economics social and cultural moments in history that evolved in very different ways, but at the same time with very similar characteristics within the same time frames, within the same temporality, as you, as you said. Um, and the only way to be able to look at these things is through interdisciplinary work. It's impossible to just go to an archive uh, <laughs> and, and just assume, unless you have a lot of money and you can just jump between archives and continents uh, <laughs> and just travel all over the world, um, it's very difficult to be able to, to find an analytical framework um, that will allow you to actually explain these issues if you don't look at them through the lens of, okay, I'm a historian, sure, but I may need to look at something from the perspective of the sociologist, like you do. Like, I'm a music historian, sure, but sometimes I need to think like an anthropologist, not a historian. Um, and I think that Moving forward, or at least I would like to think, and I really hope that moving forward, uh, history as a discipline, history as a, as a science, if you will, will be able to recognize the value of, of interdisciplinary work much more than it has so far. I mean, obviously, a lot of young people, a lot of young historians like us uh, are definitely looking at history through this lens. But unfortunately, academia doesn't work that way. Academia is still very much ruled by old people um, <laughs> who are just tied to their to their seats and their, and their posts. Um, but I, I really appreciate you coming and joining me today and, and talking with me about these issues because it is very interesting to be able to realize just how closely related some of these things can be. When we were talking before we started the recording, we were conversing with Darren, and I said, I usually have something to say about the, the topics uh, that I'm interviewing my uh, my guests about, but in your case, I'm not entirely sure if I'll be able to say anything, and I ended up talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, thank you. Thank you so, so much, Darren. It's, it's been a pleasure talking to you. No, thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. Okay, and we will see everyone next time. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook, and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history.